as far as recently, like when I talk to people who have been there in the last couple of years, you can't take a shit near that border without a fucking sniper rifle trained on you. So how, like what, how much had to go wrong for something like that to actually happen and for all i mean there, there, there's what like 1300 people that were killed or something like that it's a lot there's a lot of people so it's it is a it's a disaster and it doesn't help that netanyahu gets confused with being representative of israel when he's not mm -hmm. and it doesn't help that israel gets represented as a democracy when it has been it has absolutely been a thriving democracy in the past but it has been showing signs of weakening democratic values. Why do, why do you say that? Because how many, like, like you said, Netanyahu has been in power for like in and out of power for like 25 years, Yeah. right? He has, he, for people who don't know, Netanyahu is the Israeli equivalent of all the drama that surrounds Donald Trump, right? He is also under corruption charges. He is also under criminal charges. He is also known as being like uh, somebody who is hyper loyal to his own faction rather than to the, to the people of Israel. There's a half of Israel doesn't want Netanyahu in power, just like half of the United States doesn't want Donald Trump to be in power. Yeah, wildly, wildly uh, controversial figure. Only somehow he has been a prime minister, moved out of the office, moved back into the office, always retained some kind of power, even um, even around even when he's shrouded with criminal and corruption charges and fraudulence charges, right? Like there's all sorts of bad stuff around this guy, but he still has this power because like you said, his cabinet, his cronies are ultra orthodox, yes. ultra right. And they're the ones that are really calling the shots. The world can hate Netanyahu because he takes the bullets for everybody else that he represents. But the question is, is Israel becoming more democratic? Because they're calling for, just look at what happened, you know, after Benny Gantz, who was part of the war cabinet. Benny Gantz stepped out of the war cabinet in May, I want to say it was. I think that's right, yeah. And he said, if we don't have a solution to end Gaza, I will leave the war cabinet. Yeah, respect to him, by the way. And then he did. He yeah. said, fuck this, you guys, you don't have a plan for Gaza. I am yeah. leaving, I won't be part of this. What did Netanyahu do next? He dissolved the rest of the war cabinet. <laughs> he was like, oh, well, shit, if Benny's going to leave, don't need it. we don't need it at all. <laughs> I got your war cabinet of one right here. And then all these, what's that sound like, dude? That sounds a whole hell of a lot more authoritarian than it does democratic, right? So, and then what is, yeah. Jordan is a fantastic example because Jor Jordan, they're gangster in Jordan. Yeah. Like, Mukabara? The, right? the American military loves working with the Jordanians. The Jordanians like working with the US military. They are not oil rich. They are just legit hardworking, yeah. like industrial, entrepreneurial mindset people in the Middle East. And they're strategically relevant because they're neighbors to Israel right there in the center of the Middle East. But they're also Sunni and, and, and you know, pro, pro Sunni, pro sure. Islam, pro everything else. So the, the, Israel is not the only benefit or the only benefactor that we have in the Middle East. We're on good terms with UAE, we're on good terms with Saudi, we're on good terms with Jordan. We have other allies in the region. But the reason that Israel is so valuable to the United States is because we built that country after World War II. Like their democracy is based on our democracy, based on the UK democracy, their industrial base, their manufacturing process, their natural resources are valuable to us, whether it's the gem trade. I mean, one of the largest exporters in the world of... of um, high-tech medical equipment is Israel. Yeah. So if you want an MRI, you're getting it out of an Israeli machine, unless you want to start getting your MRI out of a Russian or Chinese-made machine. No, oh, fuck that. Right? So there's all <laughs> sorts of reasons why we want to maintain, not to mention the promise that we made to the Jewish people coming out of World War II that we would make sure that it never happens again. Right? So there's all sorts of reasons why we need to protect the state of Israel. But that doesn't mean we need to adhere to this idea that there'll never be a two-state solution on the land where Israelis live. You think that we built it, though? That's an interesting comment. Oh, are you kidding, man? That's that's That was our MO coming out. Who built France? We did. Who built Germany? We did. I agree with that. UK? We that. did. Japan? We did. Everybody who was devastated coming out of World War II, we built their countries, rebuilt their countries with debt, financing, with democratic okay. principles, whatever else, okay. right? And and that's what we did with Israel too. We went in there and we were like, hey, we're gonna give you this land 
And on top of that, we're going to give you economic structure. We're going to give you trade. We're going to give you aid. We're going to make you dependent on us. And then in the process of doing so, Israel became very wealthy. And guess what? Guess what? Israel buys all their weapons. Guess where they buy yeah. all their tech from? Us. Yeah, yeah. So I, 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 okay, I understand now. Yeah. I mean, Germany is like the ultimate case study that literally, like the whole Western half of the country was done by us after that. That was crazy. But, you know, you and I, the last time we were sitting in a studio together was – down in in Tampa with Danny and Jim like a week before October 7th. Mm. So we were like two weeks off having a <laughs> fireworks of a podcast. But, you know, this is the first time we're really talking about that and, and litigating what the fuck happened here. And so I remember the last time we were in a studio, just you and me, was June 2023. And to your point earlier, we talked we talked a bit about Mossad there for maybe five minutes or something about some of the tactics and stuff like that. But they're at the center of October 7th to me because, you know, if you've studied up Mossad and, I mean, for you, if you've seen it because you worked in espionage, so you know a lot more than us, like they're widely respected as a very talented intelligence agency for various reasons. You can read books like Gideon Spies. You can read a book like Ronan Bergman's Rise and Kill First, which is really, really telling as far as the mentality and everything. And then you look at something like October 7th and you're like, how the fuck mm. did they let this happen? Because, you know, you're talking about guys, obviously it was a very impressively executed mission funded by Iran, as you laid out earlier, not disputing that, but like they still had to go across the border mm -hmm. into Israel, which... You know, if you, I haven't been on that border. I think I was when I was 18, but I don't remember it. So that doesn't count. Like, as far as recently, like when I talk to people who have been there in the last couple of years, you can't take a shit near that border without a fucking sniper rifle trained on you. So how, like what, how much had to go wrong for something like that to actually happen? And for all, I mean, there, there, there's what, like 1,300 people that were killed or something like that? There's a lot, there's a lot of people. So the, the reality is that the way that that attack happened on October 7th would have required a lot of communication and cooperation and collaboration between multiple different agencies in Israel. Mossad is charged with external intelligence, meaning intelligence coming in from outside of Israel. Shin Bet is in charge of protecting the land of Israel. Shin Bet's their internal service. It's almost like FBI and CIA. But yep. then it happened on the border, which means that there's like a border control element and their border patrol element in Israel is closely tied to their defense force, IDF. Yeah. IDF. So you basically have three different organizations that all have to collect information and communicate and disseminate that information with each other in order to identify a threat, and then they all have to collaborate to protect and prevent against that threat. So what happened on October 7th isn't a failure of one agency. It's a failure of multiple agencies. And since the, since the October 7th attack, what we've learned is that there were members of the IDF who saw suspicious activity and reported it up the chain. And then the people up the chain within that, that agency had differing opinions about whether or not it should be disseminated to Mossad or Shin Bet or the credibility of the reports at all. Shin Bet had reports that they escalated up the chain. Mossad had reports that they escalated up the chain. But at the bureaucratic level, the communication didn't happen. And if anything, in my opinion, that is what makes October 7th similar to 9-11. It was a failure of communication between multiple agencies that resulted in a tragic attack. Yeah, here we had the CIA and FBI famously going at it and not exchanging info. Which led to the development, the whole creation of the Director of National Intelligence, the whole creation of TSA, the whole creation of Homeland Security. Oh, all that government agencies. <laughs> because I love that. the two couldn't talk, so we need three more to make yeah, sure they throw, talk. Throw another letter in the alphabet. Could you imagine? Habit. That's like saying like a husband and a wife can't talk, so what we need is more spouses. That's right. It's like, you know what I really need is I need another husband and two more wives to be part of this. <laughs> And that's gonna increase. That's gonna improve our communication. Yo, fuck the husband, but we'll take a couple more wives. That's it. Got us some options, baby. But I, I, I don't know. You know, 
that day has been relitigated because of what has happened politically and then on a war aspect afterwards. And so you have this very, very strong sentiment around the world where it's much more like, yo, fuck Netanyahu mm. and what's going on here because obviously terrorist attack, very bad. Obviously, there has to be defense or something like that for that problem not to exist. But people get hung up on, you know, things Netanyahu said in the past. Like in 2019, he told the – he told – he said in the Knesset, like if you don't want a two-state solution, you have to be okay with funding Hamas. Does that mean Israel was funding Hamas? Not necessarily. Mm. You don't know that. But when you have the leader of, of the party saying that, it's like, oh, mm. you know, are you playing two sides against the middle here? To get what you want and, you know, because something bad will happen if you do that. No matter how you're getting the money there, hidden or not, it doesn't really matter. You know, and there seems to be an indiscriminate, and unfortunately this does happen in war all the time, we've seen it, but there's an indiscriminate effect on human life mm. that we're seeing in Gaza. And I, and I say that with the asterisk that like... You can't believe every number that comes Correct. out. There's propaganda on both sides. Right. When I see the death count, like I looked at the death count this morning. I'm like, okay, it's probably not that. But it's not good. Mm -hmm. There's rockets being fired everywhere. The images are the images when you look at it from a drone. Like, yes, there's cities that are leveled. I get it. War is ugly. But like, where does it end? I think that's the million dollar question. Um, the... I don't see I don't see this conflict ending soon. I see it escalating before it gets before it ends. I also don't necessarily think I, I don't think that Netanyahu is gonna get his one state solution. If anything, what I'm I agree. What's what's tough is this is this is a decision that multiple countries have to make because supporting Palestine and establishing a two-state solution and making it sustainable is never going to come from just Israel. And because the United States needs Israel to be happy with the United States, it's not going to be led by the United States either. We'll sit back in a nice, like, velveteen chair and say, we think there should be a two-state solution, but we're not going to get off of our asses and go in there and help make it happen because there's no benefit to us. There's a benefit to us if Israel is stable, there's a benefit to us if Israel is strong, there's a benefit to us if Israel has, you know, an economic, if, if they have an economy that is pro-US and continues to buy US weapons, they don't, we don't need a second Palestinian state to have all those things happen. So we'll sit here and we'll preach, but we're not going to take action. The place where the action has to happen is in the Middle East itself. It's in all of the Muslim nations. And if you start to have a a, a banding of Muslim nations together to support it, that could move the United States because now we have larger interests at stake. If Saudi gets involved, if UAE gets involved, if Jordan gets involved, if Egypt gets involved, now the United States can't, can't sit on their ass anymore. Even more so if we start seeing China or Russia or Iran or, you know, the BRICS nations, if we see them start to lead the development of a two-state solution, then you'll see the United States jump the fuck out of their seats and be like, oh no, we're here to help too, <laughs> right? Let us keep our influence in this region. So the, the, the way it ends, I don't know. I, do, I will say this, Netanyahu is the one leader in the world right now who's at the largest likelihood of being unseated from within. All the talk about Putin was never really valid. The idea that Putin's cronies were somehow gonna take him out or replace him or overrun him from inside. We've seen you know, now how saying. untrue that was. Netanyahu and the democratic process itself, he stands a real, a real risk of actually being voted out, vetoed out, pulled out, kicked out, something. I don't think he's gonna be assassinated from within, but he is a strong arm leader right now and Israel has to decide whether they want a strong arm leader. And they have plenty of alternates, like plenty of opposition leaders to choose from who can step up and take Netanyahu's place. And the United States doesn't want to see an authoritarian Israel. They want to see an Israel that is pro-US. And an Israel, that, an Israel that's pro-US is an Israel that relies on the United States. Yes. So the United States is going to back somebody in a race against not Netanyahu. It's just a matter of when.
Thank you for watching the video, guys. If you haven't already subscribed, please smash that subscribe button and check out this clip's full podcast episode by clicking here or in the description below.